Good, e good evening, everybody. My name is Robbie Luckett. I'm director of the Margaret Walker Center and professor of history at Jackson State University. Thank you for joining us for this special virtual exhibition opening, Liberty House and Craft Cooperatives with Dr. Thomas Kerson. I'm happy to moderate tonight's conversation with Dr. Kerson. This program, first of all, I should say, has been made possible through generous support of the Mississippi Humanities Council. As always, we're grateful to the Humanities Council and the good work that they support throughout our state and community. But this exhibit and today's program are in tribute to Dr. Doris A. Derby. It was my great honor and privilege to call Dr. Derby, who passed away on March 28th, 2022, a mentor, colleague, collaborator, friend, and she wrote. Dr. Derby was an administrator, professor, documentary photographer, speaker, author. She earned her Bachelor of Arts from Hunter College in New York and her PhD from the University of Illinois. After teaching elementary, elementary school in Yonkers, New York, Dr. Derby joined the civil rights movement in Mississippi to work with grassroots organizers in black communities and to take steps to impact societal change. She was one of the organizers of the March on Washington in 1963. As a 10 year civil rights movement veteran, almost entirely in Mississippi from 1962 to 1972, her work has been recognized in publications and films. She was a contributor to Hands on the Freedom Plow, a wonderful book that contains 50 SNCC women's contributions to the civil rights movement. One of her recent books, Poetography, Artistic Reflections of a Mississippi Lifeline in Words and Images, 1963 to 1972, contains a combination of the poetry and documentary photographs she created while working in Mississippi. And her most recent book, Doris Derby, A Civil Rights Journey, which I encourage all of you to purchase a copy of online, provides a glimpse into the depth and breadth of the work that she did. From 1990 until her retirement in 2012, Dr. Derby was Georgia State University's founding director of African American Student Services and Programs. In 2011, she was honored with the Georgia Humanities Award by the governor of Georgia. Her work in photographs depicting the life of Americans who defied the post-emancipation status quo brought about by the political, economic, social, and cultural domination and exploitation of this country has appeared in museums, galleries, and universities literally around the world, including the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum here in Jackson and the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC. For years, she resided in Atlanta with her husband, actor, Bob Banks, a man I continue to deeply admire and respect. And I understand we have some of Dr. Derby's family and friends, uh, including Mrs. Maul Bruce, who I see is here in the comments, um, watching online today, we extend our warmest welcome and wishes to all of you. What um, is really amazing in my mind is that I didn't meet Dr. Derby until 2014. It feels like I knew her my entire life, and it's hard for me to imagine a time when she wasn't in my life. We met for the first time ahead of the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer. She was then working with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History to donate artifacts and images to the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, slated to open in 2017. And she had an exhibit at that time, Women Agents of Change in New Orleans, which she hoped to have come to Mississippi in time for Freedom Summer uh, and the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer, I should say. I jumped at that opportunity. And over the last eight years, I've been lucky enough to curate produce six of her exhibitions at Jackson State. Liberty House and Craft Cooperatives is the last of that work, the link to which can be found in the comment section um, of Facebook and YouTube, and it should be posted there soon for you. As in all things with Dr. Derby, she was the driving force behind making this exhibit happen. It's her images that you will see and her legacy represented in the work of Liberty House. But other than Dr. Derby, the credit for this exhibition goes to Dr. Thomas Kerson, my friend and colleague who is joining us for this conversation and traveled with me to visit Dr. Derby one last time in Atlanta in, it, in February of this year. He had the vision for this project from the beginning and made it all happen. 
Dr. Kirsten joining us now is an associate professor of sociology at Jackson State. In 2021, he was awarded the Mississippi Humanities Teacher of the Year for Jackson State by the Mississippi Humanities Council, our sponsor tonight. Tom served two terms as president of the Alabama Mississippi Sociological Association and has written a number of peer reviewed journal articles, book chapters, and most recently, the incredible, remarkable, fun book, Where Misfits Fit from the University Press of Mississippi, which won the Stanford M. Lyman Distinguished Book Award in 2021. Tom received his PhD in 2003 from Mississippi State University and is a retired Army Medical Service Corps officer. Tom, it's good to see you. Welcome. Hey, it's always good to talk with you. Yeah, I, uh, um, I remember fondly uh, uh, being with you in Georgia. I, I had... <laughs> I had wondered how we were going to get in there and it was just a straight shot into her house. And we, uh, we had a nice conversation with her. It's just amazing. Uh, all the stuff she collected over the years. But uh, I guess one thing I would say about Dr. Derby is she was a, a, a person with a mission and it seemed to me, she always had that mission and uh, you better not get in the way. That mission was uh, everything to her. And so um, I think we really need to honor that, that because of that, that, focus. Uh, we have all these things that come from her efforts. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that. And you're, you're right. She was um, a force and, and one committed to the work that she was doing. And um, yeah, I see in the chat again, Ms. Bruce, who was there that day, we got to meet her. I remember as we were leaving, Dr. Derby had me wheel her up to her computer so she'd get to work at her emails <laughs> that day. Uh, an incredible spirit. I miss her greatly. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to you, though, that we're able to do this and have this conversation and produce this exhibit um, and talk about Liberty House and the craft cooperatives and the kind of the little known or lesser known story um, therein. And so let's why don't we just start there for folks who um, are watching who might not know. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of Liberty House and the craft cooperatives? Yeah, oh, well, so um, Liberty House uh, was probably the uh, uh, prior to that, FDR had these uh, uh, cooperatives, farming arrangements. And Dr. Derby and I had a discussion about that. She said, we were not, you know, because I was telling her, you know, there is a history about alternative uh, living and e economies and whatnot in Mississippi. And I think it's important that we express that, uh, that historical element especially now when we have a lot of folks saying, you know, that history is whatever a, a powerful group says it is. Uh, but anyway, so I was looking at Providence and Delta cooperative farms and these things like that as an example prior to that. But when, you, and that was in the thirties, when you get to the late sixties, early seventies, you don't, you really kind of have a, a nothing uh, going on in terms of alternative economies or not even an alternative economy, uh, something that allows, people who are marginalized an ability to sustain themselves and maybe make a buck or two on the side uh, for, uh, if it's not for sustainable reasons, just to be able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, have a little bit of chump change or whatever you want. So um, what uh, these craft cooperatives allowed folks to do is gain a little bit of trade knowledge or however to uh, make leather, uh, works or candle works or whatever, and make a little bit of money off of that and be uh, self-sustaining. And so that was really a big thing uh, for Mississippi because it, it was among the first African-American craft cooperatives. And these craft cooperatives uh, were spread out through the whole state. Then each one would do certain things like textile or leather works or whatever. And, and, and so how did they actually come about? Who started these and, and, and when? Yeah, I, I failed to mention Jesse Morris, and that's how I fell into this, is I was looking at, at uh, alternative economies and such because I am a, a you know, I, I spent my te some of my teenage years in a commune, and so I was trying to uh, explore if there was any diversity of communal experience outside of where I've been, uh, especially in Mississippi, because we don't think of that, Mississippi and Alabama, and then I saw Jesse Morris uh, in the sovereignty files. I started exploring those sovereignty, the, you know, the uh, Department of Archives and History, their sovereignty files are a mother load of all sorts of interesting information. And from that, I was like, wow, there were these cooperatives with 
you know, five to 10, usually African-American women, uh, uh, older African-American women who were trained out of Edwards and other places, but mainly Edwards uh, by Jesse Morris and uh, Doris Derby and a few others to learn how to do candle making or whatever. And then they would go out to their actual craft cooperative, produce those things. Then those products would be sent to Liberty House in Jackson. And the Jackson Liberty House would sell those things or send them to Liberty Houses in Greenwich Village or out in California. And the one in Greenwich Village, wow, was clerked by Abby Hoffman for a time. So I was like, it just blew my mind all these things were happening. I said, well, I have to talk to some people. Finally found out that among the people that are still were still around, one of them was Doris Derby. And so it was just luck. It was just pure luck that uh, uh, you know I fell into this. And, and so these are products of the civil rights movement. This is part of kind of the intentionality and, and I guess in some ways should help us broaden how we define what constituted the civil rights movement. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, uh, Doris Derby, but Jesse Morris, uh, probably even more so, had little patience for highfalutin ideological, you know, like, you know, uh, we need to uh, uh, destroy the hegemony or whatever. They were very pragmatic. How do we get money into people's hands that rarely have money? And the best way is kind of a Christian way in a way, and that's, uh, you know, show them how to fish and, uh, you know, give them some craft uh, te uh, technical skills and give them the, the uh, materials and let them run with it and see uh, if they could uh, make some money on. And they did for a little while and uh, things broke down because they didn't really have a strong business model and business um, organization within that structure. But uh, the, the idea that this could be a form of civil rights and empowerment through just pragmatic skill learning and, you know, taking on a craft and selling these crafts across the nation. Because remember, this was also the, the time of also primitive arts. And I use that word loosely, uh, but you got Grandma Moses, you've got all these things, you got all this stuff kind of coming up uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. You mentioned the Sovereignty Commission, which was the state of Mississippi spy agency for folks who might not know. We actually had a publicly funded spy agency that worked actively and nefariously to undermine the civil rights movement. What about Liberty House would have particularly perked their interest in what these guys were doing? Well, I did ask Dr. Derby that because she would have firsthand knowledge, even though, you know, I've, I've talked to, uh, we had an underground newspaper in Jackson. It was called the Kudzu. And so a lot of these underground activities, they were kind of orbiting each other. And in fact, Kudzu underground newspaper would advertise Liberty House, uh, the, the store. And, uh, you know, the thing of it is, uh, once you get kind of uh, guilt by association and, uh, you know, another way of uh, personal or personifying the Sovereignty Commission, as I have, is the KG, KGB and the Keystone Cops. Uh, so they would gather all this information, uh, some of it, most of it useless, but it, it, what they were doing is they were kind of worried, I think, two things. They're worried about Jesse Morris because he was a powerful person and just the power that he had being a black man, a young black man. Um, and he was being able to affect social change in Mississippi. They, you know, that's not a good thing for a person who's a sovereignty commission or whatever. Uh, the other thing, too, is a lot of these African-American ladies that were taking up these skills and some old, uh, men and whatnot, they had employment, underemployment or, you know, kind of marginal employment. Um, and a lot of white folks, white housewives counted on these domestic servants. And when you, they got pulled out of that and went into the Liberty houses, these craft cooperatives, some of those folks didn't take kindly to that. But uh, the, the actual organization itself wasn't um, uh, uh, harassed as much as other, um, uh, you know, counterculture organizations that existed in the Jackson area. But yeah, they kept an eye on Jesse Morris. And there's plenty of stuff about Doris Derby in the Sovereignty Commission files, too. Uh, what could you just tell us a little bit more about Jesse Morris and who he was? I, well, I want to talk about Dr. Derby more too, but um, but I, you, he he's clearly central to this story. Yeah, he was uh, like she. He was part of the whole SNCC, and um, um, in fact, I think he was uh, had some time in um, uh, that 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 building that he, you run, the Cofo Center, Cofo, the Council of Federated yeah. 
organizations. Mm -hmm. Right. And so they all come out of that and, uh, you know, sort of spread out and, you know, when it, when it kind of, uh, 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 you know, this days were numbered, they had to look for other things to do. And so he uh, had his hands in a number of things. He, he was involved in all sorts of uh, uh, nonprofit associations, um, uh, you know, groups of all sorts uh, in Jackson, trying to improve Jackson, not only for African-Americans, just, he was just an all around Renaissance guy. He was in his, uh, you know, twenties, thirties around that time. And he is the, uh, the mind behind this idea of the craft cooperatives and how, how can we uh, teach people who have no social capital or human capital? How can we teach them so that they can be self-sustaining? And that's a big thing in counterculture, especially, um, me, uh, you know, uh, communal life and all that, the catch word is sustainability, sustainability and uh, that you don't really have to depend on someone else. And that was a big thing back then. So he was part of that. And then he was going around with Dwarf Derby across the nation. And he had some um, high profile linkages on the East Coast and elsewhere. And he's trying to make money uh, flow back down to, um, you know, Jackson. Uh, when the business models weren't working so well. And he was just involved in a lot of ways. Just um, everything above the board. He wasn't a rabble rouser. He, um, not that I, there's a problem with that, but he wasn't that, he was very pragmatic. Try, a solutions guy. Yeah. Well, tell us more about what Doris Derby was doing and her relationship to Liberty House. Oh, well, she was a person of, uh, with many hats. And so I guess the biggest thing that she did for Liberty House was she spread the word about it across the nation. Uh, she was vivacious. Uh, she was out there. Um, and she knew every aspect of Liberty House, and she could explain it. So she had spent a long time uh, learning all the processes and whatever, the ins and outs and the obstacles with Liberty House and how to make it, um, uh, try to make it work. Now, Keep in mind, none of these folks had a business background. So there's that. I mean, the, the in, ingredient for probably its demise is in that fact. Um, but she knew all about Liberty House and she spread the word across the nation. So she was the person who would go to all sorts of events and uh, women's uh, uh, League of Women Voters across the nation, whatever, whatever group would have her just talk about Liberty House and how could they start a Liberty House in their particular city and get some of those goods out to that. So she was like a PR person more than anything else. And kept a camera with her almost all that time. Well, there's that. And so, yeah. And, you know, I kind of, she does the thing I rarely do. I take, I like to take pictures as well, but every time there's a great picture, I, reach for my camera that should be in the seat next to me and it's not there she obviously had her camera with her all the time and so we are all going to benefit from that because these pictures are uh she and i had gone through them along with robbie and uh you know these are some of her uh you know some of the key pictures that she thinks would convey what liberty house or what she thought would convey what liberty house was all about and she would spend quite a deal of time with me talking about what each of these pictures meant. Yeah. I'm noticing that we're starting to get some comments and questions in the, in the, on Facebook and YouTube, just would encourage people to post those there. We are going to come around to some um, questions. We'll choose a little bit later in the program uh, and, uh, and hopefully be able to address them. So if you do have questions that are popping up, feel free to throw them up there. Um, and we are going to try and leave some time at the end to address um, some of those. So, Dr. Derby, let, let's talk about what the experience was like working with her, um, picking out these images, going through them. What was that experience like? Well, she's thorough. And again, she's on, uh, she was on a mission. Um, and so whenever you worked with Dr. Derby, you had to uh, allocate, you had to be there 100% for her. Uh, you couldn't. <laughs> And I don't, and you know, let me just say this. I don't believe such a thing as multitasking is. <laughs> Some people are good at it, but I know I'm not. Uh, with Dr. Derby, you don't multitask. Your unitary focus will be on what is that hand. And if it, she's with you, she's that focus. And so um, it, uh, the point of it is, uh, you know, with these pictures, I could kind of guess a little bit what's going on, but she was there and she could put 
subjective meaning into these pictures more than me trying to kind of interpret it as a sociologist, historian, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and she would spend a great deal of time telling me why this is important and why I needed to have three of these pictures to really emphasize um, the fact that, you know, uh, that this was an actual up and up organization and not just some, you know, uh, club. Yeah. I had the great pleasure, high honor of speaking at Dr. Derby's Celebration of Life. And one of the things that I mentioned was <laughs> if she called you, if you had a time where you were going to be talking to her, you better be focused. You better be ready to be engaged because how she was going to be, and you're yeah. going to, have to be on your toes uh, yeah. because, because she was going to make make every second count. Uh, yeah. and, uh, it was it was pretty impressive to see. So let's talk about the uh, exhibit. Um, uh, what are some of your favorite images? I think you might have some that you would share with us, even possibly, and talk okay. a little bit about here. Well, so let me see if I can click on share here and slide. So um, let me. And I see the comments still coming. And um, yes, Pastor Willis, we're glad you're here. Um, and uh, I see Robert Belcher and um others in the comments um, we're glad to have all of you guys here and uh, again you can see the exhibit online we'll post it in the comment section here again on both facebook and youtube i'm sure it'll go back out here any second for you guys as tom is pulling up his images hopefully we can it's uploading as a, in a moment here um so as, as i'm waiting for it to upload these are Four, I just picked four of my favorite and a map just so you can kind of see the spread of these uh, uh, craft cooperatives across Mississippi. Now, folks uh, who look at the website just realize there are more than four. <laughs> there are more than four there. So anyway, I think it's up and it's showing here. Yeah. Um, first off, uh, before I get the pictures, and I'm sorry, Robbie, I know uh, you asked me about the pictures, but I, uh, I Put this on there because I think you mentioned I think it's useful. Yeah, it's very useful to see the map. Um, and I don't know why the red star pops up way there. The ja Jackson should be the red star, and it's not a Freudian thing, it's just red star just because it's you know the headquarters. Um, but you can see where all these little circles are, those were uh, craft cooperatives, and this was a very conservative listing that I have. Ones that I kept seeing because uh, those uh. Mississippi Department of Archives and History has a lot of archival stuff from Liberty House. If many of you didn't know that, they they do, uh, and I had sifted through all that. And so one of the key, uh, one of the rules I use to say, yeah, this is a persistent craft uh, cooperative, is that I keep seeing record after record and not just a one-off. And so these places created all sorts of things. Um, you know, for instance, uh, where is it, uh, Canton? did uh some textiles so they would dr make dresses and things like that west point i believe was candles but i'm not 100 percent. i don't remember exactly but anyway that's all mentioned in in uh, the uh margaret walker liberty house website or web page let me ask you what determined what would be sold or created in those places local knowledge or i mean what kind of drove that um people who were trained uh, interested in that particular uh, form of craft and they would come out of that and that they, also too that they had some type of facility because it meant that they had to have an investment of some sort of building uh, that people could get out of working as uh, house domestics or domestics that's redundant um, you know get out of that and work in this uh, until they could get up to level where they you know would uh, not have to worry about finances as much so they had it was kind of a uh, you know I think more than anything, the uh, interest of the people in the cooperative, what they wanted to do. But quite a lot of them did textiling. And not only of dresses and uh, things like that, they did the shikis. They uh, uh, did, and Dr. Derby made a big point about this. Um, when you think of dolls, especially after uh, one of the reasons why board, uh, Brown versus Board of Education came about was the, the uh, lack of dolls of color for children of color, right? And so what some of these cooperatives did create was these little rag dolls that were 
brown and all sorts of shades in between. And she was so proud of that and talking about that. And so they, they were doing all those types of things and selling them, like I said, across the nation to those Liberty houses. But there was one Liberty house and it was in Jackson. So all these various cooperatives would send their goods. And then Jackson would send materials and, um, you know, other things back and, you know, their uh, cut of the money. So it's truly a cooperative like any, you know, like any other cooperative. Um, so moving past that, there's Do Dr. Doris Derby right there. Um, and, you know, just look at the titles that she has. She's an external developmental officer, director of public relations, marketing and fundraising, coordinator of craft, cooperative development training and international crafts. I, uh, <laughs> that's a lot even back then. And that's was on top of resume that already existed. Yeah. So I would say picture of her is so beautiful. Yeah. And you know, this is this is one and this is a late sixty, so the black uh, black is beautiful uh, whole thing there. Um, but more than that, this was where they were asserting that uh, autonomy is probably the thing to do. Um, you know, we can't really look towards uh, and wait for someone to do something for us. And so even in her own life, whoops, uh, you see that. And so uh, there she is, very, very powerful woman. Yeah, and I see uh, uh, someone mentioning about the dolls were beautiful and really something to see. And I think they're in the exhibit at uh, uh, two museums. Um, I, I'm not so sure, but I think there is a doll. Someone will have to check me on that. But I, I think there, there are some uh, artifacts from Liberty House in there that uh, people should uh, keep an eye on. And I want to thank those folks, too, because uh, they really have uh, helped. Um, you know, I don't know how many people know about Liberty House. Uh, and, you know, I'm all about getting the story out there like you are. And as the, is, the, I assume, uh, the two museums getting this really interesting story out there. Uh, so next one. <laughs> And that's a, the only, you know, Doug Jenkins was the other person that had multiple hats. And literally, I loved the picture just yeah. because of the hat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like a Dr. Zeus, whatever. And so you got a humor. You can see he's smiling. You know, they were working. Um, they didn't know the what the end would be. Uh, it's Mississippi. They're, you know, they're African American. They're, they're uh, lots of issues, but they're trying to make the best of what was going on. And they have this thing that Jesse Morris and uh, Dr. Doris Derby were doing. And he was the kind of the logistics guy. So he was the, the logistics man behind the whole scene. And um, I just love his hat and just his demeanor just in the picture. Of course, it's a Derby picture. And then, too, the white space, the foreground and background type of thing. Yeah. And I just... You know, you hardly ever see that, that uh, uh, when a picture, you've got to fill it up all the way. And uh, in this case, I don't know what that is behind him, but there he is, just a hat, him, a smile, and an outlet. That's an outlet, I suppose. As someone who does photography, you I'm talking about, um, how would you describe Dr. Derby's photog photography style? Um, very... Uh, phenomenological uh very much uh she uh um she encounters events and takes a picture and she just happens to be like uh, at this point the forced gump of these events with her camera and so she takes the pictures as she sees them and uh so she's very organic very organic in a way uh and thank god for her pictures because you know i one thing that uh, most of us don't think about now in these times because what do we carry in our pockets all around with us? Phones. Yeah, we right. take pictures all the time, right? Is it how rare it was for people to take pictures even back in the 60s and early 70s? Uh, you know, there's so many times I'll go through some archives or something. Uh, I'm reading something and I'm saying, man, this deserves a picture. And there's just no way it's going to, unless you can kind of imagine one, um, a lot of these things don't have pictures. And so we have just, you know, another fortuitous aspect of this is that she has all these pictures. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, uh, her, you know, her collection is mind boggling. And you can speak more of that than I can. <laughs> um, and I see that uh, some people are saying stuff on the, on the comments. So we'll get to that here in a second. This one I love. 
is that you actually have, if you look here, <laughs> it's just, it's like the whole family operation and they're just there and they got their little, what do you call it, swaths? Yeah. yeah. Um, and my wife does some of this, but, uh, you know, this really hit home for me because my mother, when we were in a commune, we didn't have any money. And I'm not just saying as an old guy, you know, we went uphill both ways in the middle of a blizzard uh, through barbed wire and all that stuff. But one Christmas, she spent the whole Christmas or the time up to that Christmas before that making a patch, uh, what do you call it, quilt, patchwork quilt by hand um, with swaths or whatever. And I was a teenage boy. And so what do you think a teenage boy is going to feel about that? Um, and so we were very, 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 very poor. But now I regret not having that. And I think about that quilt as a testament to my mom and the love that she had for me of that and that we you know we had nothing but she was going to do something for me and so when i see these things and see the people who are making them it's like that yeah it's like that so, and it's a lot of work but you know these can be very communal too people get together and they chat they pass gossip and in this instance there's some guys in there doing it too okay <laughs> so um when Robbie and I saw this and, you know, we talked to Dr. Derby about this and I guess she was, it wasn't that she was reluctant, but she just, she didn't, it didn't just set the, uh, you know, blow a fuse like it did with me. Uh, this, uh, I'm not sure who the fellow is. Uh, it almost looks like kind of. Um, also with a fabulous hat. Yeah. I mean, this looks like our logistician here. Uh, and then you have this other fellow here. These were Liberty House folks selling Liberty House wares at Woodstock. You know, so talk about the reach and talk about the orbiting of different cultures and different things and how, again, this Forrest Gumpy aspect of her uh, life and Jesse Morris's life, they were it's just like a zeitgeist or, the you know, a sign of the times that these orbits would kind of uh, all uh, align and at you know, just in this fashion. And so <coughs> there it is. And now, <coughs> you know, I've, I've seen the films, all sorts of films um, about Woodstock, but I promise you after seeing this picture, there's not going to be an instance where I'm not looking in the back, trying to see where that van is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or <with> Dr. Kirby. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. And so uh, this just blew me away and we had to have this picture and it's on, it's on the site. And, um, uh, I should say this, Robbie, um, uh, after the fact, I have a number of posters uh, that I'll have, uh, I'm having printed up, and I'll be able to get those out to folks, um, and I'm sure you guys can give me your addresses through uh, Margaret Walker Center, or however we do that, or on the a website, and I'll send you all this stuff out uh, uh, as best I can, okay, and I have uh, lots and lots of postcards with these, some of these images, as a, uh, well, you see, you've seen it on the, uh, the advertising the lead up to this, um, that sort of, a, uh, you know, collage of all those photos and stuff. That's what that will be. Some of those yeah. pictures, you can have that. So if, if folks are interested in getting a, a poster with some of these images on it, um, I'd be happy. They can email us at the Margaret Walker Center. I'm posted our email address in the chat um, and they can contact us and we can put them in touch with you to, to make that happen. Um, you know, uh, I, th I was think thinking about this picture of Woodstock in particular and thinking about Dr. Derby. Uh, so many people at her celebration of life talked about Dr. Derby's love of music and dancing. And, and it's one of the things she was known for, dancing everywhere, right? And she was a classically trained dancer amongst all of her other many talents. And so I was thinking about this and was th thinking, you know what? I bet when she heard she could go to Woodstock, she jumped at that opportunity, right? <laughs> just, and I can imagine Dr. Derby out there dancing away the night at Woodstock. Yeah, and, and who wouldn't? And, you know, uh, when I think back to the, the uh, video, the, you know, the movies, it wasn't just rock and roll that was being played at uh, Woodstock. There was some blues and some other things as well. Um, and so I think uh, frivolity and fun and all that stuff was had by all and uh, that they were a part of that. It just blew me away. Again, fortuitous serendipity was a major element to all this stuff that we've been involved with. 
but yeah, seeing that picture there just kind of it just put the bow on top of the package uh, for us. And uh, I think it uh, if if anyone sees this stuff, they'll say, yeah, this was not a joke. You can go back and look at the, all the pictures and see that they had to be trained. There was lots of thought going into this. It existed for quite some time where most of these civil rights movements didn't last very long at all. It lasted a lot longer than that, 65 to about 72, 73, something like that. Um, and it would have lasted longer if they had a, a, a better business model. I'm just sure of that. And it persists in other ways because now if you think about cra crafts and craft cooperatives and whatnot, th no one raises an eyebrow. It's just kind of, you know, yeah. It's the same way with health food. Health food was really avant-garde back in the sev early 70s. Now you just go to the fresh market and buy your stuff. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, back then it was something else. Well, I do think that this image is a great metaphor for Liberty House overall and, and all the things that you mentioned, its reach and the work that went into it. Also, the, the fun and, 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 and how much they cared about it and cared about each other and the economy of it all. And um, what a what a great image. And I'm so excited that we got to include it uh, in the exhibit as well. Um, so you know, what are the lessons of Liberty House? Um, what can we take away um, from um, from Liberty House and, and what can we take away from the exhibit? Maybe that's two different questions. Yeah, well, from Liberty House itself is um, that there can be a different form of civil rights uh, activity um, besides the traditional. So when you think about civil rights uh, as it's usually portrayed in the media, is marching or something of that nature, right? Or uh, speeches. <clears throat> but how often have we thought that civil rights and civil rights or empowerment uh, that flows from civil rights can be brought on by learning a tra learning something? And this kind of, and I know there's some controversy. This is the, the Booker versus Du Bois debate type of thing. But, <clears throat> but learning something and then becoming very skilled at it thereby making being able to make money on your own and not having to rely on someone else because once you have to rely on someone else you're kind of beholden to them in some fashion and that's one thing they were trying to avoid so one big lesson to be learned out of this is that they were trying to go around the whole that whole fighting with people that they know that they knew at that time the cards were dealt against them in that fashion but who argues against uh, you know that whole proverb of teaching someone to fish. No one does, really. And so a sovereignty commission didn't bother too much because of that uh, way of thinking. The other thing, too, is it allowed people in uh, these communities in West Point, Chula, and uh, elsewhere to become kind of, um, have something alternative, not saying uh, counter to, but alternative to the church, where in the African-American community, most everything is done in the church. Uh, and maybe, you know, uh, having something kind of uh, sect uh, sectarian is good for certain times, but secular is good for other times. And maybe making money is that proposition that you can do that on the, uh, with outside the church walls is a really good thing. Um, and then lastly, empowerment uh, in terms of identity. I, she talks so much about uh, Jackson State and in the, I think it was 70 or somewhere around there, they had asked her to do some designing. And I think the um, graduation ceremony, uh, they allowed people to, for the first time to wear dashikis. I'm not sure if it was 70 or 71. So, uh, but the point of it is she was uh, at the front of that, doing that. And so empowerment, uh, black pride, uh, the little rag dolls that were kind of, look kind of like a, a little girl or a little boy, whatever that, uh, you know, of color. Having all that there where it wasn't, is just you know it's you can't you can't put a price on it and so that's what uh the thing is for liberty house itself and i i think too it also spun up uh as another thing the primitive arts movement and crafts movement craft cooperatives which you see everywhere i mean you see that stuff just everywhere um so it was something big and this was the um she emphasized this fact and i never did check this that it was the only african-american crafts cooperative and so, or the first one. And so I think that's something to uh, keep in mind as well. 
what does the exhibit mean? Um, well, one thing, I uh, let me say it this way. I would love for people to have a, uh, discor a discourse with us to talk about this. If they have uh, relatives who ha were involved with this, we'd like to keep this story going um, and, you know, build it up at some point. There are a number of articles. I think I have a bibliography at the bottom somewhere of the website or web page uh, that you can take a look at, but um, that are more technical. But I, I just love the story, and I like the people aspect of it. And I think if we can kind of be that one-stop shop for all these folks who are uh, interested in Liberty House, and if their ancestors were involved with this, let's do that. Yeah. We just put our email address um, at the Margaret Walker Center. It's mwa at jsums.edu up there for folks who, who uh, you know, if you have connections to, to people who were involved with Liberty House, if you want those posters, you can contact us. Please uh, email us again. We will. I see uh, uh, Dr. Schoenhofer has asked us to post the website again for the exhibit. We'll do that as well um, here. We'll put that up uh, for everybody to see as well. Um, you, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, this should be a live link. You should just click on this and go directly uh, to the exhibit itself. You know, the, you mentioned the um, the dashikis and the African prints at homecoming, or that actually was at the... Um, at Jackson State at the installation of Miss JSU, um, Dr. Derby had joined the staff of Margaret Walker in the late 60s here at Jackson State at the Institute for the Study of the History, Life, and Culture of Black People, today the Margaret Walker Center. Uh, Margaret called it her Black Studies Institute. And she was on the staff when um, Eddie Jean Carr was elected Miss JSU uh, in 1970, and shortly thereafter, we had the shootings on our campus that left two young men dead, Philip Lafayette Gibbs, James Earl Green, uh, 12 others were shot, and dozens and dozens of others were, were injured, um, a traumatic part of our history. But Dr. Derby was there to record that, and we also have an exhibit of hers um, that was rooted in the aftermath of those shootings that we did. But Eddie Jean Carr, who, um, uh, today serves in public office here in Mississippi. She, um, when she decided uh, to um, dress in African garb um, for her inauguration as Miss JSU in 1971, she was elected in 1970, would be inaugurated in 1971. That was an incredible moment. Um, and those images of, of Eddie Jean Carr in the, those gowns absolutely stunning and dr derby was at the heart of that and i can see it uh you know coming um from uh this uh the, this this handcraft the, 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 this craft work uh in particular um as we're coming to the end i see people um saying thanks and um patrice jones gibbs um knowing just grateful to hear more about this history um yvette johnson how much she's learned um, others. And again, I want to extend my um, well wishes to Dr. Derby's family. We know we have, I believe her sister is watching us right now. Um, I don't know who else we have um, who um, who's on, but we want to uh, thank them for being here. I, I, I kind of want to, as we're starting to close out, if people have questions, please do post those again. Um, uh, just talk a little bit more about what it was like to visit with Dr. Derby uh, and to be with her. And what do you think, what do you think this would mean to her um, at this point? Well, I, if, if she were around, not to say I would do anything incorrectly without her being around, but boy, would I be on my P's and Q's uh, for sure. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, she would be on this program. So we, yeah. Yeah, Shoot, yeah. Up a lot of space. And right we would there. just we would just be in the background, just right. uh, getting. I would get her coffee for her or whatever. Um, you know, the, you'll see. You'll kind of see because every when you look at the pictures, everything has a logic and the organization of it. The whole nine yards. This is not willy nilly. 
Um, this is just like any other exhibit you go to. There's a lot of, and you know, I took a course from Robbie, and great course, and it was museums, museology. And, uh, you know, I really never thought about it, but uh, if I stopped and did think about it, I mean, it's not that I didn't know. When you think of exhibits, as you're walking, as, as a person who's taking it in, you don't really think of it. It's just kind of happening to you. But the person who's making the exhibit, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen. And so this st behind the scenes, this uh, the behind the curtains type of stuff uh, is, in fact, quite interesting to me. And she and I had uh, a long uh, bit of time working the behind the scenes about what well, this, this photograph needs to go here rather than there. And this person, this is to indicate this and that. And so everything was done with a lot of thought. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mentioned this, too, at her um, Celebration of Life service. Uh, I'm so grateful that we have her images, right? And we're going to be able to continue that. We're going to have this exhibit. It'll live on virtually. We have her exhibit from the Gibbs Green tragedy at Jackson State that's actually going to go to the University of Alabama Art Gallery in 2023. So it's traveling. It's going to be, be out in the world. But of all the things that we lost when we lost Dr. Derby, we lost her knowledge and boy, one of the most amazing things that always struck me when you sat down with her to look through her images, her recall, her ability to remember the people in the images, to remember their names, but also to remember what they were doing, what was going on. Uh, and she was she was going to tell you she wanted to make sure that you knew. And she was always ready and asking people if there was something she was missing or forgot she wanted people to tell her and she would take a sticky note and she would write it down and she would keep keep track of all of these things um she was a font of cultural historical knowledge uh and i'm gonna miss that about her and it's a, a loss um for for all of us i did have the great pleasure if people are interested um if you check out the margaret walker center youtube page um, I conducted two separate sittings of oral histories with Dr. Derby. Um, they're uh, three hours long. <laughs> and so you, you can listen to her story. I was so grateful to get to have that time um, to, to sit down with her um, and, and to record, so, uh, that, record her oral histories. And so you can see those. They're on the, the Margaret Walker Center YouTube page. They're also on, on our website. Um, for the Margaret Walker Center, which is jsums.edu slash Margaret Walker Center. Um, you can you can find those there as well. And and I'll just miss her. I'll miss her, her phone calls um, and, and, and miss her energy and her spirit. And God bless her. There was only one like her, that's for sure. Uh, and she, she, she deserves to rest and to rest well. Hey, Robbie, uh, great words. Uh, now I think about it, there is kind of a continuation of Liberty House that I failed to mention. And that's the Federation of Southern Cooperatives that's out of um, Alabama. It's right on the border of Alabama, Mississippi. I forget the little town, Utah or something like that. Um, but they do a lot of this stuff as far as, so it's not gone. Um, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives and uh, they're doing great, wonderful work from what I understand. Well, you know, it's like the civil rights movement itself. It never ended. The work continues. Right. The work continues. To stay. <laughs> the legacy lives on. Um, it wasn't like all of these activists just packed up and went like, "We're done." All right, we did what we could. Um, and yeah, it, yeah, it continues yeah. To this day, and I'm, I'm grateful to you, Tom, and for the work we're able to do here. Um, I do yeah. want to mention to folks um, uh, that we have an online audience evaluation. Um, that should be dropped into the chat um, here um, for everyone. Um, there it is popping up right now. That's the link to it. Um, you should be able to, for those who are watching on Facebook and YouTube, if you would, please click on that. It's a short evaluation form. Uh, it helps us with our grant reporting and also to improve our, our public programming here. Um, we're, once again, thankful to the Mississippi Humanities Council. That is a fabulous organization that does great work all over the place. And we have been so lucky at the Margaret Walker Center to get to work with our State Humanities Council on numerous projects and, and grateful to continue to do so in their support. So you're you're taking the time to fill out the evaluation form. Again, it's, it's a bit of a weird link, um, but that's it. It should be in your chat. Uh, it'll take you to a Google form that you'll be able to submit. It won't take you five minutes to fill out the evaluation. 
administration, but it does help us um, with our grant reporting um, and, and with improving um, our programming uh, as well. Um, uh, Tom, as we're starting to wrap up, any kind of last words and comments you want to leave with everybody? Well, you know, uh, the experience of Dr. Derby is something it brought home again. There are stories out there at, and taking your, you know, that course that you offered muse museology um, and talking about neighborhood museums. I cannot overemphasize the fact, don't throw your pictures away. Don't throw family history stuff away. Do not do that because uh, right now, as most of you know, we're having kind of a, a, a dust off. About a dust up about uh, what is history and what isn't, what can we say, what can't we say. And the more that's not there, the more evidence not there means it's not there uh, for you know many people. And so that lineage, that heritage, all that stuff that is gone is a tragedy. It's just a tragedy. So please, if I could uh, emphasize it, and I've seen this so many times here, everywhere, especially like uh, you know, uh, up in the Ozarks where that Misfits book is about. You'd go to auctions and you'd see bags of trash and you'd open up these bags of trash and it would be letters and photographs and photo albums uh, from the 20s and 30s and whatever. The whole story gone, you know, because they would, you know, burn the trash. And it's just, it's just sad. Well, Dr. Derby was intentional about preserving our history and anyway. our history and, and was an active, um, just example of preserving and, and taking care to make sure that, that that our history was saved. And I'm grateful for that. I'm also just want to say thanks to the Margaret Walker Center staff um, for all of their hard work um, and everything that we do. Um, Lauren Shelby, in particular, our education and PR manager, who's behind the scenes producing all of this for us so that we can do this program um, right now. Thank you, Lauren. Um, but everyone on the center staff, if you're interested in our work, check out our website, come to visit us, check us out on social media, uh, Margaret Walker Center, come to visit us. We love to have folks come, come visit COFO, um, check out the exhibit. This program um, that you're watching will be on and will live on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Share it, um, share it with folks who you know um, would be interested in, in hearing this history um, and help us um, get the word out. So. Well, uh, I, I think with that, Tom, I think we're kind of ready to wrap things up here. Thank you um, for all of your hard work and for your vision for making this happen. Uh, and again, once again, thanks to Dr. Derby. We miss you, Doc, um, and so grateful to have had you in our lives. So good night, everybody. <laughs>